G'day everyone and welcome to SSW TV. I'm here today with allround.net guru John Papa. John's a Microsoft Regional Director and a former technical evangelist on, uh, for Microsoft on Silverlight and Windows 8 client. He's a prolific author of articles and books and training courses on a diverse array of topics from Windows, SQL Server, WPF and Silverlight to HTML5, JavaScript and CSS. Today, he's going to talk to us about building single page applications. Welcome, John. Thanks for having me. <laughs> My pleasure. So, um, for those who aren't familiar with single page applications or SPA, um, can you give us a high level overview of what it is and what benefits you see it bringing? Sure. So, single page applications are really just a fancy term for building an HTML5 based application where you're really taking advantage of what's in the browser already whether using Chrome or Firefox or IE, you have a browser on your machine and now you can run an application in that browser. And the big advantage is that everybody has a browser, whether they have a small device or large device or a desktop. So you can run these applications just about anywhere. Okay. The, um, and what's the benefit that you see it as being over, you know, traditional, um, so like we're, we've been building, you know, there's lots of developers building ASP.NET sites and ASP.NET MVC sites. What does SPA bring us beyond that? That's a good question. So I'm a Microsoft developer at heart, and I've been doing a lot of ASP.NET for years and years, and, and classic ASP before that. So it's not to throw away those skills. And in fact, I still do quite a bit of SPA in a combination with either web forms or with ASP.NET MVC. And a lot of times, I call those like hybrid apps, where you've got your MVC features that you're using to load up your application. But once the data gets to the client, once, and I include with data, your HTML for your views, your JavaScript to run your code, and then the data itself. Get all the data to the client. It's really irrelevant to be able to, or not a good idea all the time to bring the user back to the server and repost if they don't need to. So the whole concept behind SPA is I've already got everything on the client. It's very easy to get it there. When the user does presentational things like moving views around or pressing buttons, things that don't necessarily need to repost the entire page, let's keep them on the client in the browser and just do it all in that. Uh, domain. And then when you need to go back to the server, you can do it through Ajax and just make your business validation calls and your business logic. Or if you need to repost the entire page, that's when you go back and hit a controller and bring up maybe a different area of your application. So think of a, a kind of a hybrid SPA approach where you're still getting all your ASP down at love, but you're also getting JavaScript and HTML on the client. Okay, excellent. So this is where, when you're talking about the hybrid, so this is like on Gmail. So you might have the um, your mail client on one view and then the calendar client on another, like on another view. Exactly. But within those two separate views, they're, they're very isolated. They're going back to the server themselves and retrieving data without posting back. Right. So you're in your mail client, you're doing what you need, you're going through different folders and searching and composing messages and even popping up little messages to write new email. All that is on the client. You don't need to have to go back to the server. But when you switch to that calendar view, I mean, let's, let's face it, everything's different. So now you're changing the entire screen. That's a great time to say, let's go back to the server, repost the whole thing, and open it up. And in fact, I think the default behavior Gmail has is open a new tab that lets you do that. So okay. if you're going to change everything on the site, on the client, that's a great time to go back to the server. If you're just changing some things left and right, uh, little pieces of it, that's a great piece to keep the spa action. Okay, excellent. So we can see. So it's really about getting a richer web application experience on the client for users. Absolutely. Okay. So this is where we can see people who are tossing up. So just I can just it's a, a scenario that's happening a fair bit at the moment is people are coming to us and saying, should we be building you know native, um, you know iPad apps or native Android applications? And we're saying, well, if you build a web application, you're going to get much better reach um, for you know what you're building. But what people commonly come back and they say is, we want a richer user, you know, we want a richer experience, we want a more responsive right. user interface. So that's why we're going native. Where so maybe what people should be do looking doing is looking at a spa, um, you know, in, in investing some time in investigating spa to be able to build really responsive web applications. Yeah, that, that's a great point. I mean, there's there's no one size fits all, and, and unfortunately, a lot of people in our industry, uh, customers especially, mm -hmm. just want to know. Tell me the one technology I can use everywhere and make it work in every place. And as we all know, that's not exactly the the perfect way to go about it. 
But what you can do is you can give them the tools to make that decision, give them a pathway. So in an HTML5 world, that's really ideal if you want to get that vast reach. And you can do that responsive design, and you can make it work for touch. And you can make it a very nice user experience and fast. However, you're never going to get, well, maybe not never, but you're probably not going to get right on the metal with um, the HTML5 Spa apps like you can with a native app. So you're going to build the best possible experience if you do one app for yourself in iOS, one in Android, one in Windows Phone, one in Windows 8, one for BlackBerry, and so on and so forth. You know, the Adam Stevenson phone model maybe come down the road. So if you build native, you're always going to get that feature that that native offers the best way. But HTML5 is a great way to say, you know what, I don't have the resources to build seven apps and seven versions of code bases. Maybe what I can do is build a spa that hits all the browsers, because I know all those devices have it. And therefore, I still get that rich user experience, and I get that good, big, big reach on it. Excellent. The, um, so tell me how I go. So if I'm going, I'm like, wow, this sounds great. I need to put some time into this. Tell me how I kick off. I go, file a new project. What do I do next? So in Visual Studio 2012, there's a new feature that came out, I believe, in February. It's, uh, I wish I get the names of their updates. But it came out in the update in February, and it allows you to create a VSIX, a VSIX file. And that VSIX file is a template. So one of the things they asked for is community members to create templates. Now, I created one called Hot Towel, which is, uh, the, the motto is, because you don't want to go to a spa without a hot towel, or at least without a towel. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone will appreciate it. So you take the hot towel, you start up your spa, with, and you create this, uh, basically all the building blocks to get going. But let's back up. What does that mean? That means you can go in and do a final new project, ASP.NET MVC4, and then the first thing you're going to see is a bunch of options for what kind of an MVC4 project. And out of the box, they're going to give you the ASP.NET template that they created, which is like a sample that gets you going with a to-do application, so you have your to-do lists. And then they also have the sample, if you pull down the hot towel one that I created, which is right on the ASP.NET website, and I can give you guys a link to that. And that will allow you to basically say, all right, give me the hot towel one. And that's going to give you all the building blocks for the responsive design, which is what natively adapts to the different device sizes. It's going to give you some CSS love to make it look a little nice, because as developers, we don't always write the nicest looking sites. <laughs> Definitely not. And it's going to give you things like data binding and page navigation and view composition and a bunch of other tools in jQuery that will help you get going with your application. So that's the best way to get started. And you can do that in about a minute or less, which is nice. Well, that's great. So in, in, this, um, in this template, what's the general architecture? So what's, give me an overview of the architecture of a typical Spa app. Sure. Uh, for, let's start in the back end, in the area that's not Spa. First of all, the server, you can put whatever you want there. You can do PHP. You can do Java. You can do ASP.NET MVC. That's my choice. And in some cases, I don't even do ASP.NET MVC. I do ASP.NET Web Forms because I don't necessarily need a lot of the MVC features. Uh, generally, I use things. My preference in my stack is going to be Web API because you yep. need to talk to the server. And Web API is a great way to do REST and JSON over HTTP. You can secure it. That's a big question that comes up a lot is, can you secure that? Absolutely. Uh, all the libraries using things like Knockout for data binding. I like Breeze for rich data. And we can talk about what Breeze does, because most people don't think they need Breeze until after they build their first app. And they wonder why it became such a mess. Uh, so Breeze and Knockout are two big ones. Another one's to Randall. And that's where I really start everybody is, before you build a spy, you want to pick the framework that's going to give you the basic features of your application, like paging, showing views on the screen, and then an application lifecycle. You know, you need to know when your view opens or closes. Sometimes you need to stop it before it closes to say, hey, wait a minute, the user's in the middle of a change. Do you want to really leave yet? Should I let you stay, or what should I do? And all that kind of stuff is just plumbing that we have to write. So Durandal's a great architecture to start with. Other um, competitors to that are AngularJS, and another one's Ember, and some people like Backbone as well. I happen to like uh, Durandal and Angular the most. OK, excellent. The, um, so we'll come and we'll, um, can we drill into those a little bit more? So Durandal's handling a lot of that plumbing. Um, yes. You said that, you said that um, Breeze handles the data management. Can you tell us a bit more about how Breeze works? Sure. So those are the three main players, Durandal, Breeze, and, and Knockout, in my opinion. And let's start with the easy ones. Knockout is simple. It's data binding. You've got yep. data in some kind of a view model on the client, or call it a controller if you want. If you'd like MVC on the client, that's fine. 
Uh, I was talk with Scott Allen a bit. I saw his interview with you all, and he's right. Basically, it's a presentation pattern on the client. You've got this object that's managing your data. I call it a view model. He calls his uh, controller. And then on that way, you've got that controller that Knockout says anytime the data changes in that, it then updates it into the UI, into the target, in your HTML. And anytime your user changes the data, it updates the model on the client. And then when you're ready, you press the Save button, send it back to the server. That's where Breeze comes into play. Let's say that you want to go out and get something beyond a to-do list. Maybe you have some large healthcare application or a manufacturing application, and you need to get a complex object graph with multiple hierarchies. You go get that data from Web API. Now you need to have object navigation on the client. Well, how are you going to store that data on the client so you can actually navigate relationships? And if you have, let's say, a person named John Papa, he's a customer, and you get 20 of his orders. You don't want to get 20 John Papas. You want all 20 of those orders to link to the same John, right? So, because then if you change John's name, you don't want to change it in 20 places. These are just things we take it for granted on the server. On the client, we can use something like Breeze and its rich data features, and it allows us to share the data. It aggregates these things so we can have object graphs, and it uh, keeps track of change tracking for us. And we want to write queries. We can write queries using a link-like syntax to go get the data or save it as well. Okay. The awesome. big thing with Breeze is really the sharing of data, though. Is let's say you have four screens on a client, and they're all looking at customer information some way. And some of them are visible, some of them aren't. What happens if one of those customers changes? If somebody changes the John Papa customer over on screen A, B, C, and D should know about it. Because yeah. otherwise, you're going to get out of sync. And Breeze will manage all that for you, which is just, you know, again, we take it for granted in, in ASP.NET and on the server. But in client apps with JavaScript, it's the only library that I trust to do that kind of stuff. Wow, that's great. So you, so it's really, it's, it's taking your server-side data, it's creating a single instance of it. It's really creating a cache of your server-side data on the client. Exactly. And then it's then allowing you, so it's really implementing, it's kind of like a, a repository, it's a cached repository on the, on the client. It's very much like a repository. I call my, what I do is I generally wrap my Breeze instance on the client up in an object called the data context. Okay. And it becomes kind of my, it can be my unit of work and my repository, or you can split them out, but it's basically on the client to do that, and if I go get a customer, and that's all I want is just the customer object, I get a customer X, Y, Z, and then later I go get some of, well, some of that customer's order singly, it's smart enough to link those two together, too. So that's the cool part. It knows what it has, and it knows when it has, uh, doesn't have something and it has to go to the server and get that data. Wow. It's a, it's a, it's, um, Spar's an interesting concept because it's, we've taken a lot of um, web developers have been server-side developers who have, you know, great developers and they love our, you know, we love our patterns, we love having clean code. Um, you know, we have our repositories, our unit of work, and we write, you know, single responsibility principle. We like really, you know, we follow all of our solid um, principles. We write great server-side code, but then we we expose our data to the client, and then it's up to the designers to make it look pretty. And then that's where patterns and practices kind of stop, because then all you're doing is, is you're rendering your data to the view, and then, you know, you'll hack some JavaScript together, and you'll expect to have a great site. But it's kind of like when, with Spa, we're moving to in building these really rich applications. Obviously, we're increasing the level of complexity a lot on the client. And sure. this is really taking it to the next level and going, hey, you know, there's still patterns and, you know, you still need to be spending as much time having, you know, well-architected, well-written code on the client as you do on the, on the server. So it's really, it's, a, it's becoming much more of a serious programmer's job on the client now where... There has been a tendency, I know, a lot to kind of, you know, once it's being rendered, then that's just a, you know, any, any, anyone with some HTML skills can do that. Yeah, and so. a lot of the negatives I hear a lot are, well, you know, JavaScript, you, you don't want to put your business logic on the client. Well, no, you don't. You want to put your presentation logic on the client. You're still going to call back to the server when you need some kind of real, you know, secure business logic to go in, like check an order, uh, order credit limit for a customer. That's going yeah. to be on the server, obviously. Send an email to somebody. Of course you're going to go back to the server. But the stuff we do on the client, it's even more important in my mind to follow good patterns like single responsibility and you know, keeping it dry and using solid in the JavaScript because JavaScript, unlike .NET, is like driving on a road. So .NET is like driving on a road with guardrails. 
if you hit that guardrail, it's going to bounce you back in, right? JavaScript still has the same road, but somebody took the guardrails off. So yeah, you can go down that road, and if you're not careful, you're going to go off into the bay. Yeah. So JavaScript won't stop you from doing those things. It's kind of like C++ or C a long time ago. You know, watch out with your memory management. Definitely, which kind of brings us into the whole JavaScript unit testing discussion. But we'll probably have to we'll probably, we'll probably, we'll probably, we'll probably save that one for save that one for another day. Yeah, but, it's uh, absolutely important to test your JavaScript. Definitely, but look, just jumping back to that um, uh, that previous conversation on your post on Spa architecture um, in the section on big data, you give a simple example of doing a query using breeds. Um, yes. When I saw it, I was I was concerned that we were you know. We're querying data directly from our JavaScript now, and I think you've kind of addressed it. But um, I think it's important that we don't lose our clear separation of concerns in our architecture. Absolutely. So, how how do you make sure that that doesn't happen? That's a great point because the first thing it's funny the Breeze folks they love and they hate this, and I know these guys pretty well because I've, I've worked with them and given a lot of feedback. They their big feature for Breeze is not the link like queries, but it's also the first thing that anybody notices. So it's yep. kind of like the shiny object in Breeze. And all the developers love the fact that you can write these link-like queries. But then their second reaction is kind of like what you just did there for a moment. It's first like, ooh, this is really cool. Wait a minute. Do I really want to <laughs> expose all that to the client? Now, yep. in the demos we write, we're exposed. Our web APIs, and like in my demos, they're demos. I, I expose yep. everything from the web API. In a real world, if I had an employee object on the server, I would not be exposing the password, social security number, date of birth, number of children, those kind of things. I would expose maybe a projection or a DTO. And Absolutely. then let the web API talk to that. So that way, Breeze can only talk to what you make the web API expose. So the key there is, yes, you can access whatever you want from Breeze if you expose it and make it query iQueryable on the server. If you want to limit it to like an RPC style programming approach, you can still do that. But the, the key is make sure your web API is as secure as you want it to be. Excellent. The, um, so once again, it just comes back to you know, implementing the, the same core concepts and patterns that we, that we use on the server side to make sure that we've got um, loosely coupled, you know, well-designed architecture. We're still applying, making sure we still carry all of that forward and through yes. into the um, into the client. Yeah, absolutely. So, like on the client, I often I often go into applications with people, and the first thing they want to do in their JavaScript is write one big long file that's got a thousand lines of code. It's function, function, function. They throw a couple jQuery lines in there, and it's it's amazing. And then they try to test it, and they're like, "Well, I can't test that," so they don't. And then they try to figure out, well. Copy and paste is really how I do modularization. Not a good way to do it. All those principles we learn on the server just get lost. The, the right yeah. way to do it is not to worry about how many number of files you have, but I'd rather have 50 files that are 20 lines of code each, as opposed to having one file that's you know 5,000 lines of code. Yeah. So by modularizing these things, you're doing dry, as you mentioned. You're keeping things. You're not repeating them. You're encapsulating. And I create these modules in the client, these files that contain one module, just like we have files that contain one class in the server. And I have a module called Data Context that handles all my data interaction. Every screen I have goes through that to get its data. Then I'll have another module called Logger on the client. Every time I log a message somewhere, it goes through that guy. So all yep. these guys are like these little black boxes, just like we have on the C Sharp world. Excellent. So. There's a there's a great post on your um, on your blog titled "Why All Those JavaScript Libraries," um, <laughs> yeah. you know, and um, so now that we're building richer client applications, how do you go about managing so many JavaScript dependencies in your project? So there's there's this great book that I've read called uh, "Made to Stick," and it's by I think Dan and Chip Heath. And I, I digress for a minute because it's really important. When you're explaining something, we all have this problem. Once you know the answer to this book problem. You can't just unknow it and figure out how to explain it. Yep. So as I've gone through explaining Spot to people, I've done this you know, dozens of times now in live audiences. And one of the first reactions when they see the scripts folder and they see 50 or 60 or 70 JavaScript files is they go, you know, they just can't handle what, where did all this come from? You know, there's, oh my gosh. And then some of them are only, only 10 script files and they're still scared of it. My first reaction is, you, you know, show me your .NET project. I'm sure you've got more than 10 C# files in there. Yeah, but the fact that it's new and different is, is uh, 
it's very alerting, alarming to them. So we have to erase that we know this information and say when we teach this, and when I look at it now, I say, all right, first of all, I don't show people the scripts folder. I hide all the third-party libraries there. And I relate that to an analogy of these are like your .NET DLLs. Do you ever go into your references folder and count them? I don't. There's a ton of them in there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm almost embarrassed by how many I have sometimes in my projects. So I don't look in the scripts folder. I put my custom JavaScript files in a different folder. So it's in its own. I call mine app, APP. And then yep. all of my code for my view models and data context and controllers, they go there. And that way, you're just visually moving their eyes away from the thing that scares them, that big yeah. scripts folder, and moving it up to the code that they need to look at. But you know, getting back to your question, if people look at these files and they see all of them, if they're named well, I think it's really easy. Just like your .NET projects, you name your files to what they are. There's a data context. You can probably guess what that's doing. There's a logger. You're going to know what that one's doing right there. You know. So if you name these things like that, it's, it's actually pretty easy to follow. And it's the same principles you have in the server to the client. And I know I keep saying that, but that's really what it is. Yeah, absolutely. And. And, and so it's really a lot, a lot of it is about treating Java, giving JavaScript the love it deserves and kind of treating it not as the second class citizen to, uh, yes. to being to C sharp. It's, you know, when it's that, um, I think when we were chatting a while ago, I said I had um, a lot of people have that moment where they change from JavaScript being their enemy to, you know, once they really get into it, they kind of start loving it more and more and more. And it's just about giving it that chance and kind of realizing that. Yes, it's different, but if you do things right, it's you know it's actually really cool. Well, like simple things like checking a null in .NET. If you want to check if a value has a value, a variable has a value, is it null? Is it zero? Is it empty? Is it un you got to check all these different ways, and we've got even helper functions and guard functions to check them. In JavaScript, you just say if x. You don't have to yep. say equals this undefined. You have to check any of that stuff. Just if x, you're done. If it has a value, it's true. If it doesn't, it's yeah. false. Definitely. So you can get to love some of the great nuances about JavaScript, and it becomes really helpful. The other side is if you don't like those things, you truly want a static language, you could actually write TypeScript. And TypeScript will give you all that static typing that you want. And then it just generates JavaScript from it. And the cool thing about TypeScript is JavaScript is TypeScript. So you just yeah. take your JavaScript code, and move it over to the TypeScript window, and it works. So there are options for people who want that static languaging. So do you, I'm guessing though, you don't use TypeScript as your first option? I don't use TypeScript as my first option. And it's, it's less that I do or don't like it than I've gotten really used to the module patterns in JavaScript, and I find that they work great for me. Yeah. Though there are times I do want to use some of those features, and sometimes I just move it over to TypeScript and keep it as is, because Visual Studio is a great editor. And inside there, it'll show you some of the errors of things that you're doing, like invalid ways to call things. And in TypeScript, they can check and it can assume and infer what your types are, even if you don't declare them. So it'll know you're expecting this to be a string inside the function. You're passing in a number. You might have a problem here. So That's for that, it's really cool. Yeah, very. So That's even awesome. without writing any TypeScript, you can actually get some good IntelliSense and some good error checking. So that's a great tip. So. It, Look, if we go to the opposite of the tip, what tips, what are the gotchas? Like after I uh, get my head around a new tool or framework, I look back and I go, here's a concept or trick that if I'd have known it or if someone had told me when I was starting out, it would have saved me a heap of time. So what's your tip for getting for someone getting into SPAR applications about what to look out for? So let me give you three tips, one for each of the frameworks that we talked about. Cool. So I like threes. Durandal. You get into Durandal, it's great, it's fantastic. And it's, it's got a lot of conventions that are built in, and meaning that if you put your views and view models and things in, in certain folders, it just knows where they are and magically will compose them for you. Uh, but one thing Durandal does do is it relies on promises. Promises are the, we're in an async world because we're in the browser, just like we had with Silverlight. So the way that JavaScript deals with that is with promises. Well, it has to return back the async answer, the promise. So inside of Durandal, when you load up your view, I commonly see you do that inside of a method called activate. And people will write their app code and activate and write it, and they'll think it's going to work, and there are errors, and they can't figure out what they did wrong. And they're looking at their code, and their code's fine. The problem is the activate method in Durandal, and most of the methods in Durandal require that you return something out of them, even if you're not expecting return. That's because they're waiting for activate to finish. So at the end of activate, you have to say return something. 
yeah. because Verandal waits to say, for example, when your screen's done activating, it might turn off the progress bar. It might turn off a bunch of other things, too. So you always want to make sure, and people forget to return from their Verandal methods. Always return. That's my first tip. Right tip. Uh, in Knockout, the big thing is much easier. You write your variables. You'll get down your properties. There is no I notify property change in JavaScript. <laughs> That's an interfacing .NET. So if you want to know if your properties change, what you actually do in JavaScript and in Knockout is you wrap your, your uh, variables in a function. So if you have a first name variable, an observable, they call it, in Knockout, you have to put at the end of it parentheses. If you don't print your parentheses, you're actually referring to the function. You're not executing the function that gives you the value of, of first name. And it's the most common thing, and I still do it a lot too, where you'll type in, oh, just put first name in this field. And then I'll look at it for five minutes and go, oh, I forgot parentheses. <laughs> So a knockout, that's what you want to do. Uh, the third tip would be Breeze. In Breeze, the biggest thing people try to do is they try to avoid um, getting the metadata from the server. If you use Breeze as this feature, there's actually a .NET component which works really good with Entity Framework uh, or just OData in Web API. And if you use their component on the server, it'll actually generate all the metadata that's needed for the client in Breeze to know all those relationships and the object navigations and the caching. Really? I've seen a lot of people beat their heads against the wall going, I don't want to use that. I want to use this instead. And then they try to man manually create all this metadata. I'm like, okay, I get it. You want to see if it's possible. But there's a happy path right over here, and it takes three <laughs> seconds. <laughs> so don't go against the grain and breeze. <laughs> wow, that's great. And now, are, the, are all of these um, tips, are they incorporated in your samples? Most of those are incorporated in there, and I'm actually coming up with a course probably in May or June called Spa Tips. And oh, so I've fantastic. done two courses for Pluralsight already that are how to create a spa. And what I did is I put some tips throughout those, but I have a whole bunch of other ones that people have asked about, such as how to secure it, or how to do a data grid or paging, or how to do things that we just talked about and debug it. I'm not going to put all those into a tips course. That's great. So. It, so, how, so if I was going to skip, what are some other? So, what are the resources if I wanted to get started building single-page applications? So, obviously, check out your blog at yep, uh, johnpasser.net. The um, and you've, so you've got a couple of plural site courses. Yep, I have two plural site courses on Spa. One's called Spa Jumpstart, which helps you think of that course as your first entry point. It doesn't tell you a lot of why. It tells you how, and it gets you going and building you something. By the end, you've built a very nice app, and it starts right from the Visual Studio file new. And you can actually follow that course and code along with it. Excellent. Uh, the second course is an intermediate one, which does a lot more manually uh, the same kind of code, and it tells you a lot more why. For example, I don't use Breeze in the intermediate course. I actually manually code out all those data things I just mentioned. And if you go through both courses, one thing you'll realize is there are about 18 files in the intermediate course with probably 1,500 lines of JavaScript code that do what Breeze does in about 300 lines of code in the other app, in one file. Yeah, that's great. So, but it's good to understand the why, obviously, so you know what it's doing. Absolutely. And then you can really appreciate what Breeze does. Yes. And all those things, like Durandal, I didn't use that in the intermediate course. I did all that by hand. And that was also much more code. Yeah, so you can do these things without these libraries. You, you absolutely can use vanilla JS. But it, the question is, how supportable and maintainable is that? That's great. So. Awesome. And um, and also on the ASP.NET website, you said there's a um, there's a one of your modules is available. Yeah. Yes, that's a good point. So if you go to ASP.NET slash single dash page dash application, they have a site there where they show a bunch of things about the templates that came out in February. One of them was the one I created with Hot Towel, Excellent. and one of them is the one I helped with with the uh, ASP.NET team to create the to-do sample application. On that same page is a videos tab, and you can actually watch module two of my Pluralsight Jumpstart course for Spa Jumpstart for free. So they've worked out a deal with Microsoft, and you can watch the whole thing, and it, it goes through all the things that you need to know to get started. Wow, that's great. Mm -hmm. Look, and I'll put all of those notes, obviously, on the, um, on the, on the page that we're hosting on. And um, look, Spa sounds great. It sounds like everyone should be spending some more time uh, improving the responsiveness of their uh, websites. And John, thank you very much for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me, guys.